and to share our time together in the word. And uh, I appreciate that uh, someone did the work to put the PowerPoint into Mandarin as well. So that um, will help those who need some help with the English. And as Ray mentioned, I'd like to share with you today about living in the love of God, living in God's love. And uh, I'd like to start off with a, a question, and it's, it's this one. What does God expect from you? What is it that God really wants from you? Is it um, more obedience, holiness, a service, more commitment, more devotion? What is it that God wants from us? Now, I confess it's actually a trick question because the question presupposes that God is, is a rather greedy, self-serving God who wants to get stuff from us and uh, he wants to squeeze everything out of us than he, that he possibly can. And I, I venture to say that many people think of God like this. However, I believe it's a, it's a mistaken understanding of God. What does God want from you? The answer to that question may surprise you. And I want to look at the book of John to think about this question. One theologian remarked that the book of John it was a lot like his wife, whom he loves very much, but he cannot say that he understands her completely. Um, well, John's book is kind of like that. It's just very deep, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of layers that uh, invite um, investigation. John chapter one, verse thirty-five. And the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, "Behold, the Lamb of God." Many had become followers of this great prophet of God, John the Baptist. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? Um, John the Baptist had been announcing that someone very great was about to appear on the scene. So expectations ran high. And uh, when John finally said, here he is, I don't know if Andrew and his companion understood what Lamb of God meant, but they realized that this is the one that they were waiting for. And so they follow Jesus. And as they're going along, the Lord turns around and he says, uh, gentlemen, how can I help you? Uh, what do you seek? And I think this caught them off guard. Like, what do you say when you run into Messiah on the street? What would you say if, if you ran into the Queen of England on the street? <laughs> well, how do you speak to royalty and how do you speak to God's Messiah? And probably these men were stuck for words and they quickly tried to think of something to say. And finally, one of them blurted out, um, whereabouts are you staying? I think it was an attempt to get a conversation going. It sounds like small talk, a question of no particular importance, like talking about the weather. And um, they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? Then he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now, it was about the 10th hour, and uh, that would be about four o'clock in the afternoon. So Andrew and his friend got invited to his place. Well, that's what they were really hoping for. And they spent the rest of the day with the Lord. Now, this incident seems very mundane uh, and nothing like the marvelous miracles that follow in this book. It seemed like a very everyday incident, nothing very significant. Did John throw this in as a filler? Did he have some extra space on the page? No, I don't think so. John never wastes words. He doesn't add irrelevant details. As I thought about this story, it suddenly dawned on me that this incident 
is of tremendous importance. It illustrates the whole message of the book of John. It takes us to the heart, the center, the essence of the mystery and wonder of the mission of Christ. There's rich spiritual meaning here. So let's look at it by asking two questions. And uh, here's the first one. Where does Jesus live? Where does he live? That was the question that the two disciples of John the Baptist asked. Where are you staying? Now the word lived or staying is one that John uses many times, uh, over 60 times in the book of John, this word shows up. It's the word translated abide in John chapter 15. It doesn't refer to an, uh, a short visit. It means to permanently reside somewhere. So where does Jesus live? Well, later on in chapter one, he is called Jesus of Nazareth. That's his hometown. That's where he's from. And later on, we know that he moved to Capernaum. And uh, that's where he hanged his hat, where he slept at night. That's where he lived geographically. But John is going somewhere else with this thing. He's not talking about geography. He's talking about where someone lives on the inside, not your physical address, your spiritual address. Where does your heart live? Well, this is something that John has already talked about in this first chapter of his book. Look what he said in chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. In the New International, it's rendered like this. No one has seen God at any time, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known so this phrase talks about a very intimate uh, relationship uh, this is where christ lived on the inside he lived in his father's embrace he lived enjoying delighting in and sharing the love of his father it, it's a phrase that deno denotes unity and intimate closeness, a fellowship of togetherness, of sharing and delight. So where does Jesus live? He lives in God. He lives enveloped in the Father's embrace, and he talks about it a lot in this book of John. Notice, for instance, in chapter 10, what the Lord says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, Believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Interesting phrase. I am in the Father. He is in me. There's this deep connection. Some refer to it as a mutual indwelling. The Lord lived connected at the deepest level to his Father, this inner spiritual union between father and son. One scholar of the past said this, by virtue of their eternal love, they live in each other to such an extent and dwell in one another to such an extent that they are one. So there's this marvelous inner togetherness that goes on. Uh, the Lord lives in his Father, and the Father is in him, and there's this connection. This is where the Lord lives. He lives in God. He has always lived in God. The Father always has loved the Son, and they've shared everything in the eternal joy of the Holy Spirit. He spoke about this in John 17, 24, when he said, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. What was there before there was anything else? Before there were planets and plants and persons? Well, in the beginning, there was love. There was love between a father and a son who shared everything in the fellowship of the spirit. And uh, John has been talking about this from verse one of his book. In the beginning was the word and the word was with 
God, there's a witness, there's a relationship. In the beginning, there was love. Love is the one thing God did not need to create because God is love. And uh, so if we go right back into eternity, what we find is the fierce, passionate, determined, life-giving love that flows between a generous father and his beloved son in the life-giving spirit. Now, we get a picture of this in the first chapter. And um, in verse 33, John the Baptist speaks, he who sent me to baptize with water sent said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is what God told John the Baptist. He was baptizing a lot of people. How would he know when Messiah came? God said, you will see that the Spirit comes up upon him. That's him. That's the one we're waiting for. And so at the baptism of Christ, when John baptizes him, something unusual took place. Suddenly, the heavens were opened. Uh, a voice was heard from heaven, and a dove came down. And uh, John saw that happening, and he said, that's him. That's Messiah. He's the anointed one. Uh, John says, I saw with my eyes the spirit come down in the form of a dove upon him. He's the awaited Messiah. And what we have in the beginning of the gospel at the baptism of Christ is a fascinating glimpse. For the very first time in the scriptures, we see a manifestation of the Trinity. We get hints of it, but now we get it more clearly shown to us. Notice the Father speaks from heaven. The sun is getting baptized on earth, and between them flows the Holy Spirit. And it was in the form of a dove on this occasion. This is a, this is a Trinity moment. This is really the first um, clear manifestation of the Trinity. The God that we believe in is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not a bachelor. He's a trinity, and trinity basic, basically means relationships. God is all about relationships. Relationships did not begin with Adam and Eve. They were eternally present in God. And when we say God is love, this is what we're talking about. Because in eternity past, um, who did God love? You can't send love out into a vacuum. Love is something that one person gives to another. And if God was not a trinity, God would not be love because there was no one to love. Then there would be no one to love before creation happened. But love always existed. God is and always has been love because forever the Father loved the Son in the fellowship of the Spirit. So there's an incredible relationship of love, joy, fellowship between Father and Son that is somehow related to the Holy Spirit. Are we made to understand that the Spirit is the love that flows between them? That he somehow personifies the love that proceeds from the Father and is fixed permanently on the Son? Um, a number of great theologians like Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Jonathan Edwards, have studied this subject and they came up with this conclusion. Uh, the father loves the son. The son loves the father. There's this amazing love that flows and the spirit of this relationship has a name. It's called the Holy Spirit. He's divine. He's a person, but somehow he's deeply connected to this relationship of love. Um, he's the spirit of the father and son relationship. He is the love that flows, the bond of love in the divine community that flows between father and son. Um, and we hear these words, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That was the only topic of conversation, the love of God for his son as the spirit came down. Um, the spirit uh, 
His love flows like an unstoppable river. Uh, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, it's a, an awesome experience. You can't help being taken aback by the sheer power and volume of water that flows incessantly over the falls. It's overwhelming. That's the Holy Spirit. His love flows like a mighty river. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and they share all things together in the abounding, overflowing love of the Spirit. And uh, we, we need to understand that this is who our God is. He's not simply a monarch sitting on a throne. He's a relationship of love that exists and has existed forever. And this is one of the deepest, richest, and most important truths that we can know about God. So this community of togetherness came into view in a new way that day at the Jordan River. Jesus went down into the river, the Father spoke from heaven, and the Spirit descended. It was a Trinity moment. And the topic of discussion was love, and that's to be expected because that is what this three-in-one divine togetherness is all about. You are my beloved son. And the Lord found himself embraced by the love of the Trinity. That's where he had lived since eternity. And Jesus resided in the village of Nazareth, but his true home was the Father's embrace. This dance of love that is rich and full and passionate and beautiful. So here's the first question. Where does Jesus live? He lives in the Father's loving embrace. That's where he lives. So here's the second question. Where did Jesus plan to take them? When Andrew and John says, where are you staying? Uh, Jesus said, come and see. Come and see. Um, now, the Lord could have said, gentlemen, I am glad you asked that question. As it turns out, I live in the most wonderful place in the universe. I live in the abounding fullness of my Father's love. There's a trinity here. Uh, and I live in the joy of, of my Father's love and the fellowship of the Spirit. That's where I live. And I want to take you there. I want you to live there as well. Well, the disciples were not ready for that much theology. It would take a while before they could process the magnitude of what this was all about. And he would have to take them there step by step and gradually unfold this mystery to them. Rabbi, where are you staying? The answer to this question is what the book of John is all about. And where he really unpacks this topic is in the last part of the book. So let's just go there what we call the upper room discourse. Uh, chapter 14, verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Notice Jesus doesn't say heaven. He says, my father's house. Um, that's where he's always lived. And this is where he wants us to live as well. He wants to take us to the Father's house. And usually what we think of is heaven. And that's true. That's part of it. But there's, there's something more here. The word translated mansions or dwelling place shows up again later on in this chapter in verse 23. And look what it says. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's the same word that we get in the first verses. So the father and the son are going to make their dwelling place with us by the spirit. How amazing is that? Now, Jesus is talking about going away. And he talks about coming back. This is the repeated theme of chapters 14 to 16. And sometimes you wonder, is he talking about the second coming or about the day of Pentecost? The answer is yes. And F.F. F. Bruce in his commentary speaks of a vanishing distinction 
in these verses between the two phases of his coming. So Jesus is going and coming back. And this is not only going to happen at the second coming, it's going to happen in a sense when his spirit comes. And when he does, there will be a spiritual dwelling together that happens. So what Jesus is saying is this, where my father lives, it's a big, big place. It's a big house. There's lots of room for more people. There's lots of love to go around. There's more than you can imagine. I've been living there forever. All this time, I've been walking around Galilee with you. On the inside, I have been living in my father's embrace, enjoying his love. And that's what I want you to understand. I live in his house and you can't even begin to imagine how wonderful it is. The love and the joy and the fullness will just blow you away. He's got a big house and my plan is to take you there. Verse six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Now, Jesus is not talking about going to heaven when we die. He's talking about getting connected to the Father while we live. And Jesus came to establish that connection. We could say that he is the way to the Father. He is the truth about the Father. He is the life of the Father demonstrated to us, the one who has come to draw us, draw us into the life-giving embrace of the Father. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? And once again, we get this fascinating idea of this mutual indwelling. And in these words are contained is contained the heart of the gospel message, this incredible bond of intimacy, love and joy between the Father and the Son. They're caught up in this, this heavenly dance of goodness and delight. And that is where the Lord is taking us. Uh, verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. He keeps on talking about this. He keeps on repeating this. He wants us to understand, and it's more, he wants us to get in on this relationship with his father. This is the foundational idea that the Lord unwraps in this final section of John, verse 16. And I will pray the father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Someone just like Jesus was going to come. And uh, he was going to abide with us. Uh, now, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, which would be sent from heaven to indwell those who believe and trust in Christ. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice those two words, with you and in you. Up to now, the Spirit has been with them, but something new and better is going to happen. Uh, he will come to indwell, to be inside of, to give us the divine presence on the inside, the spirit giving us the desire and the power to live a Christian life. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Well, just a minute. The Lord has been saying he's going to send the spirit. And now he says, I will come. So which one is it? Is it the spirit coming or is it the Lord who's coming? Oh, it seems that the Spirit is the Lord come in a new way. It's the Spirit of Christ who comes. It's the Spirit who brings to us the presence of Christ and the value of the work of Christ. There are four pillars of the gospel, four 
important pillars that the gospel rests upon. The first one is the incarnation and life of Christ. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. The second one is the atoning death of Christ. He gave his life for us on the cross. The third is the resurrection and ascension of Christ. He ascended and sat down at the right hand of God. But there's a fourth one. If we only had the first three, the gospel would be history, ancient history. But there's something else, the coming of the Holy Spirit that Christ sent from heaven to indwell his followers. And the Holy Spirit brings to us all that was obtained through the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Through the Spirit, we are connected with God. And we become recipients of what Christ accomplished for us. And so now there's a spiritual connected connection it's not just that we believe in christ we receive the spirit of christ he indwells the believer a christian is someone in whom the holy spirit dwells that's what a christian is not simply someone who believes or attends a church uh, the spirit of christ has come to indwell him and that is what makes us a believer and we now belong to him so the the baptism of the holy spirit is not an optional item for the religious zealots or the spiritual elite it's a part of the package it's an essential component of the gospel and the holy spirit brings to us the presence of the resurrected living christ and he makes us participants of all that Christ is and has done for us. If the spirit doesn't come into our lives, all that Christ did would be little more than ancient history. It is by his spirit that Christ brings us into a living connection with God. Now get this part. Here's a verse that is um, remarkable, amazing. Verse 20. At that day, what day is that? Well, that's the day when the Spirit comes. That's the day of Pentecost. At that day, you will know. What is it that we will know? That I am in my Father. Well, Lord, you've mentioned that several times already. You've said it again and again. But you will know that I am in the Father and something else. What is it? And you in me and I in you. Now, the, the Spirit of God is going to bring to light that the, the connection that Christ enjoyed eternally with his Father is now the one that we will have with him because the same phrase that the Lord uses to describe his relationship to his Father, the Father is in me, I am in him. Now he uses that phrase to talk about our relationship with him you in me and I in you and it's the spirit of God that brings it about so notice the bond of love of the holy trinity comes to the believer and connects us with God there's a uniting with God that happens by the presence of the holy spirit uh, we are brought into this divine fellowship celebration of joy the spirit of love that unites the Trinity, the love that flows between father and son comes into the heart of the believer. How amazing is that? This is all about being overtaken by the love of the Trinity. Folks, I'm afraid we don't have the faintest clue of what this really means. Um, now, when we think about the Holy Spirit, we often think of the fruit of the spirit galatians chapter 5 22 23 the fruit of the spirit love joy peace and those other wonderful things that the spirit brings into our life or we think of power for service the gifts that god gives us by his spirit to serve but there's another aspect and this is the the foundational aspect the holy spirit creates a union with god he unites us with god now god is in us now he is in us and we are in him. 
So fruit and power is important, but the, the basis of the Christian life where we start is this coming into the fellowship, into fellowship with God. The first rever reference to the ministry of the Spirit in the book of Romans, here it is, Romans 5, 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Now, love is not a liquid that you can pour into somebody. How does God pour his love into our hearts? He gave us his spirit. The spirit of God is somehow the personification of the love of God. And the spirit of God is God's love coming to dwell within us. And he comes to confirm that we are the children of God loved of the Father. So this is where the ministry of the Spirit starts. And if we are going to walk in the Spirit, we need to perceive the reality of the love of God for us. If we skip this part, we're not going to get very far with the rest. So a believer is someone in whom the Spirit of God's love comes to dwell. Now, chapter 15 of John, and this verse kind of pulls it all together. Verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. How did Christ live? He lived receiving, enjoying, sharing the love of his Father. In other words, he lived in the Spirit. His life was rooted in the love of God. Uh, th that was where he lived and moved and had his being. He lived enjoying and sharing the love of God. That was the life and ministry of Christ. And notice, friends, this is where Christ has come to take us. And he says, abide in my love. That's the same word that we had in chapter one. Where do you stay? Abide, live, reside. Abide in my love. This verse is saying, that the place where the believer is to live is in the love of Christ. Jesus lived in the love of his father. He showed us the love of his father. And he says to us, now, I want you to live where I have always lived. Stay there. Live there. Build your house there. Don't go anywhere else. This is where I live. This is where you need to live. And then he says in verse 11, these things. I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. What is this joy that the Lord speaks about? My joy. I want it to be your joy. What is that? Well, Charles Spurgeon makes this comment. The joy of Jesus is first the joy of abiding in his father's love. He knows that his father loves him, that he never did anything else but love him. Now, that is the joy which Christ gives to you, the joy of knowing that your father loves you. Jesus is saying, my joy is to live in my father's love. That's, that's what makes my heart dance. And if you start living where I live you are going to experience the same joy that I have. I want you to have this joy, and I don't want you to have it partially. I want you to enjoy it fully and completely. So what the Lord is saying is, this is where I live, and this is where I want you to live. Now, man was originally created to live receiving God's love. It's like the, the fuel that ignites our hearts. We were created to live enjoying, responding to the love of God. And um, that love teaches us to love God and to love others. And that's the, the, the greatest commandment, loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. 
that's how people were designed to live. First of all, to receive God's love and then to respond to God's love and obedience and worship and loving our neighbor. People were created to live according to this original plan. This was God's design. This is how our humanity was made to function. We were designed to be recipients and channels of the love of God. However, what happened? Well, the enemy came along and he said, is it true that uh, God does not allow you to eat of all the trees in the garden? It seems like he's holding out on you. It seems like uh, he doesn't want you to have full enjoyment of everything in the garden. And the enemy came with lies about God. And as we believed the lies, we fell into sin. And those lies became a part of our default setting in our thoughts about God. And people think God is out to get us. And he's this ogre. And uh, we have these negative ideas about God. And where did that come from? Well, those are the lies that the enemy, he's blinded the minds of people, Paul said. And if you don't receive love and life from God, well, where are you going to get life and love? And so people will become idolaters and we turn to idols and we look to money and sex and pleasure and fame and success and other idols to get what only God can give us. There's a problem with the idols. They don't work. They don't fulfill the need that we have because we were made by God and we were made for God. We were made to live in God's love and only that can satisfy the deepest needs of our hearts. So the gospel is the revelation of God's love to us through the person of Christ who renews our understanding to understand who God is what his love is like so that once again, we can live in the original plan, receiving, enjoying, and responding to the love of God. And the Lord comes to restore the original design for human beings that we would live in the enjoyment of God's love and that we would live as responders to that love, loving God, and loving our neighbor, we can love our neighbor even if he doesn't love us back because we get enough love from God to give love to others even if they don't love us back. This is how people were designed to live and this is the restoration that Christ brings. So we ask the question, <clears throat> where does Jesus live? And the answer, he lives in the Father's embrace. Where does Jesus take us? Oh, he takes us into the Father's embrace. He, that's where he takes us. And that's where he wants us to live. That's the gospel. That's the home where believers live. Becoming a Christian is a change of residence. We now live in the Father's embrace. When the two disciples said, Rabbi, where are you staying? They had no idea. They had no idea who this was and where he lived, that he lived in the ecstasy and goodness and passion of the triune God. Well, the Lord came to show us what the Father is like. He came to show us the Father's heart and the Father's love. He was the final word about God that dispels all the lies that the enemy told us about God. If we have trusted Christ as Savior, this is our home. This is where we need to live. This is where our heart needs to live. So the Christian life is living in the love of God. Someone said that living in the awareness of our belovedness is the axis around which the Christian life revolves. This is not a minor point. <laughs> the Christian life revolves around the fact that we have been accepted and loved by God. John Wesley said this, we must love God before we can be holy at all this being the root of all holiness. Now we cannot love God 
until we know he loves us. Interesting. Uh, Wesley is saying that holiness, a holy life, a godly life, uh, flows out of love to God. And love to God starts when we learn that he loves us. So we're back to Sunday school, first class, lesson one, Jesus loves you. But 10 years go by, 20 years go by, 30 years, we're still trying to figure this out. We're still, still trying to understand the, the marvel, the wonder, the mystery of the fact that Jesus loves me. And there's nothing more wonderful than that. And our hearts find it too amazing to believe. It seems like it's too good to be true. Now, when those disciples said, Rabbi, where are you living? It, it tells us that one of them was Andrew. The other one remains anonymous. We don't get the name. Probably it was John, the author of this book, but we're not told his name. Probably there's a reason for that. It's so that each one of us can identify with that unnamed disciple and become of this part of this journey to come to live where Jesus lived. You are loved by Abba. You are his precious child. And he wants you to know that. And he wants you to live in the enjoyment of that. This is truth that sets hearts free. Uh, that frees us to love others, even if they don't love us back, frees us to relax in the security of being loved by him and to live lives of gratitude, joy, and service to God. I'm not very good at this, but I'm learning that I am valued and loved in spite of my failures, that it, there's nothing I can do to deserve this. I have trouble wrapping my brain around that, but I'm learning to live there, and it's a wonderful place. As we learn to live in Abba's love, every enjoyment in life becomes a token of his love. The birds and the flowers and the taste of blackberries and coffee and nature walks and sunshine and the world becomes more beautiful as we realize that this is God's good creation and there are signs of his love all around us. So what does God expect from you? That was the original question. What is it that God wants from you? Well, actually, God is really not attempting to get something from us at all. <laughs> what God wants is this. He wants you to live each day in the assurance of his unchanging love. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. And everything else flows out of that. That's where the Christian life starts. That's where Christian service starts. We are not trying to get loved by God. We live from the love of God. We live as those who have been loved of God. This is what the Christian life is all about. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love, stay there, live there, build your house there. That's how this Christian life works. It lives by living in and responding to the love of God. Maybe I'm speaking to some who have not yet surrendered their life to Christ. And to not know Christ is to have a heart that has not found its home. We could say it's like homelessness on the inside. Well, Christ came to find lost, homeless people. He came to find us, to forgive us, to change us, and he came to bring us home, home to the Father's embrace. And if you've never done it before, you need to say, Lord Jesus, I need to be found. I need to be forgiven. Thank you for giving your life for me on the cross. Come into my life. Save me. I trust in you as my Lord and Savior. Make me part of the family of God. I encourage you to do that today. And if you had any idea of how much the Father loves you, you would not wait one minute more. So I'll leave you with this verse. As the Father 
loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. This is the miracle of the Christian life. This is the wonder, the goodness, and the joy. This is where it all starts, and this is where we live from. May God teach us to live and to enjoy this wonderful blessing and reality. God bless you today. Amen. Jurgen, could you close in prayer? Yes. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the wonder of the gospel. There's nothing more amazing, remarkable, spectacular than the message that we call the gospel. And the more we learn about it, the more wonderful it becomes. Thank you for unexplainable love that has come towards us. And thank you that we're invited not just to one day be in heaven, but we're invited to live in the Father's embrace. Teach us uh, more clearly to live in that wonderful reality. Bless your word to us today. We thank you for it in the wonderful name of your son. Amen. Amen. Jurgen, please hang on. We, we will have some questions for you. Jeremy, can you play our final song, Draw Me Close? Nothing else could take your place